So I'm going to start with some background and um, I can't give you all the history of the Middle East region in a talk that's this short, but I want to give like a brief framing, at least to help introduce us um, to the things that are relevant to the talk. And then I'm going to talk about the memes that I analyzed for this paper, how I did that analysis. I'm currently also writing a guide on how to study memes. So it's really important for me to make my methods more transparent and let people know what my process was and how they can also do it themselves. Um, and then I'm gonna tie that analysis to memes um, as mapping tools and what this concept means, what, are, what its implications might be. And after that, we'll open it up for discussion. So please know that you'll have time for questions. So an important question to start with is, what is a meme? There are many definitions out there. I use Lemore Schiffman's definition. I find that it's broad enough yet specific enough to work with. Uh, Lemore Schiffman defines memes as a group of digital items that share common characteristics of content. So the things that are in them, what they look like, uh, their form, the way that they look, think about like text, does it have text, does it not have text, and stamps, um, which could be defined as the feeling that they convey or the mood that's in them. And they were created with awareness of each other. So they're sort of in conversation with each other. They're a group. A meme cannot be just a one a singular thing. Um, and uh, they're circulated, imitated, or transformed on the internet by many users. So, so that process of imitation and transformation is necessary. So with imitation, there are parts that are supposed to be kind of the same. But with transformation, there, there's an editing process that goes there. You change the caption. You might uh, copy uh, uh, some parts and edit other parts. And many users is left here um, kind of vague on purpose because uh, you know a lot of us are in some like chat groups uh, that have maybe three or four people and memes start to circulate there. So many users could be a really small group of people, but we also all know memes that go viral and are shared by thousands or millions of people. So many users can be a lot uh, of uh, different numbers. One example is the distracted boyfriend meme, which some of you maybe have seen floating around the internet. I brought three examples here today. Uh, so as you can see, um, the content, the image is the same in all of them. It's imitated in all of them. The structure is limited, is imitated in all of them, um, but part of the content is different. So in the one on the top left, me is distracted from work by literally anything else. Um, in the one on the top right, me again, distracted by the groceries that I bought with the pad thai, $30 pad thai that can be delivered to my door. I feel like we've all been there. Um, and the one at the bottom, specifically dedicated to Heather. <laughs> um, maybe your cat uh, is distracted by the very uh, fancy castle that you got for it that probably cost a lot of money by literally any cheap little box. Um, okay. And the memes that I focused on um, in this paper specifically are images. But I also wanted to stress before I dig into this that memes can also be videos. We've seen videos on maybe TikTok or videos like music videos like Gangnam Style or even dances like the Harlem Shake. We've seen those turn into memes. Memes can also be a sentence. Who here has said or heard somebody say, thanks for coming to my TED Talk? So that's an example of a meme that's simply a sentence. So they can take many different forms. And memes have been used across the world, both to reinforce and disrupt power relations. Um, indigenous activists in Australia, for example, use memes to bring together a movement against the erasure of indigenous people and raise awareness about the ways that Australian colonialism has been enacted over time. In China, internet users deploy creative content, including wordplay, memes, parodies, to express political dissent or criticism and participate in what's become sort of a community ritual. Within the Arabic speaking context specifically, scholars have shown how memes can be used as tactical social actions, whereby the subaltern 
use as means in their struggle towards justice. I've also talked previously in an article uh, in the International Journal of Communication about memes being part of a general cultural push whereby youth use this type of creative online content um, to interfere in the direction of global cultural flows. And these theorizations of the political and cultural impacts of internet memes inform my analysis of digital culture as an extension of offline culture, rather than seeing the internet as a, a separate space. In fact, power relations from the so-called offline can also be reproduced online. So I frame memes as digital culture artifacts that are created and circulated in a way that's deeply connected to the social ties and the cultural and political experiences in the everyday lives of the people who create them. It's especially the case in the context of Palestinians who have been living under prolonged colonial rule, war, continued civic unrest, et cetera, that this, this separation between online and offline becomes even more muffled. In this paper, I argue that memes can be conceptualized as mapping tools that chart out the connection between cultural, political, and spatial boundaries and participate in a playful negotiation of these boundaries. I think this framework is particularly useful for investigating memes in circumstances where space, culture, and politics are under constant change and negotiation. So I give the example of Palestine here, but I think there are many contexts, probably all contexts maybe, where uh, this type of framework could be useful. Palestinian meme makers specifically navigate the dynamics of living under settler colonialism, global capitalism and marginalization at the local and global levels, as well as their own cultural concerns. People wanna talk about Palestinian diversity, gender equality, and youth issues maybe that have to do with generational differences, being a student in a different town, um, popular culture uh, that they're fans of. Although new media technology um, are built on the assumption of connection through disembodiment from space, space is actually central to their form and their content. Scholars on digital culture in Palestine problematize the assumption that new media technology will bring with them a democratizing promise. Palestinians have used new media technology to recast ideas of access to land and space through, for example, creating online tours of Al-Aqsa Mosque or digitized oral history and archives. This use is important for Palestinians and other indigenous communities across the world where colonial power enforces a disconnection from the land through an erasure of the history of indigenous culture's connection to that land. This limits access of indigenous people uh, to certain places and segments the indigenous population. New media technology in this way become part of a larger matrix of power in which Palestine's borders are continually constrained, Israel's get expensive and the European Union's get fuzzy. I'm drawing here from Helga Tawil Suri's work on this specific triangle of power. Um, Helga Tawil Suri writes, from the perspective of Palestine, a core contradiction arises as a backdrop against which to understand information communication technology infrastructures. The containment of Palestinians in narrowing and disconnected spaces occurs at the same time that high-tech globalization is posited as the route to openness through which to overcome the fragmentation and containment. In other words, new spatialities and bordering mechanisms are created while others are eradicated. By outlining the ways that borders are simultaneously expanded and controlled in the advent of new media technology, Tawil Suri demonstrates that, uh, as she puts it, the technological is spatial, political, and the spatial political is also technological. This technological spatial political relationship, which is what I'm gonna call it for short, um, is manifested online through vague platform policies, discriminatory artificial intelligence, 
on platforms like YouTube and Facebook, for example. Uh, Amal Nazar, who I think I have here, wrote about this. Uh, Palestinian youth also use TikTok to connect with each other and promote their own culture, but a lot of times they get met with backlash in comment sections or even get their uh, accounts removed from the platform. So the experience of Palestinians um, on social media platforms tends to be sort of a mixed one, where they're able to form community and celebrate their culture and do creative things uh, on one hand, but at the same time, they receive much backlash, either by the state, by online trolls, or platforms themselves. And what I wanted to see is where, where do memes fit in this technological, spatial, political relationship? What are they doing for people who make and share them? And what do they do in the space specifically of um, mixed cities? So to answer this question, I focused on three Instagram pages, um, two meme pages from mixed cities that are situated in the north of Israel, Haifa memes and Nazareth memes, and uh, one more page that's de dedicated to life on the inside, that doesn't mean jail. The inside refers to the borders that were established by Israel in 1948, in case you're not familiar with the term. Um, it's called Idachel in Arabic. And um, so that page's name is Mess on the Inside, which is where I drew the title for the article. And all of these three pages have thousands of followers and post regularly. I kind of wanted to engage with um, uh, meme accounts that are active um, and popular. And I chose the latest 50 relevant memes from each of these Instagram accounts uh, to analyze, uh, but uh, posts that weren't relevant were removed. So the way that I determined what's relevant is um, um, posts had to be considered a meme. So if there was simply like a screenshot, sometimes meme accounts will post like a screenshot from the news or something like that. And there was no process of imitation, transformation, um, or something like that. So that wasn't considered a meme. So I dropped it from the corpus. Uh, in addition, I also filtered out posts that focused only on topics that were not relevant to the um, spatial political relationship that I was looking at. So there were a lot of posts because of the timing of when I wrote this. There were posts about COVID-19 that were just about like wearing your masks under your nose or over your nose. So stuff like that, that had nothing to do with the context outside of COVID-19 or mask wearing that didn't mention any specific group or culture or city or politician or something like that. I removed those posts. They were likely also copied from other accounts, but I had no way to determine that. Um, but uh, yeah, so if posts discussed COVID-19, but within the context of people's relationship, to culture, to the state, to the city itself, then those um, I left in. And people often, often ask me about this. So I uh, went ahead and shared uh, this image here to explain um, that in my process here, I included the visual part. So the image part of the meme, um, or for those folks who are at home, uh, you can see it on the right side of the screen. And I also included the caption that's at the bottom uh, the rationale behind this was that the text was often uh, not edited onto the image. It's like, it's much quicker if you screenshot an image and then instead of having a caption on the meme, uh, you just use the caption below. So there were some memes that were image only and the caption um, below had to be included because I didn't want to uh, miss out on any commentary or a lot of times that's where the butt of the joke was. And for my analysis, I based it on criteria that came up from the memes themselves, as well as from the academic literature on digital media and space in Palestine, some of which I mentioned earlier. And the criteria noted things like places, like towns, neighborhoods, cities, countries, uh, cultures and subcultures that were named in the memes, politicians, celebrities, any figures that appear or are mentioned in the meme. Uh, languages that were included and other keywords that helped me identify recurring themes. And for, I have two notes kind of here, very briefly related to the analysis. 
that I understand space as kind of socially negotiated and socially constructed. This is based on Doreen Massey's work and uh, memes as a geographical concept, which can be used as a methodological tool that's suited for the analysis of popular culture discourses that transform social practices in spite of their apparent superficiality and triviality. So here, Davy Johnson is talking about memes in general, not specifically internet memes, uh, but I use this concept to kind of connect it to how space is socially negotiated and memes can be part of that negotiation. I organized the data based on three themes, which we're about to go into, but I'm going to give like a brief kind of overview to, for you all to see the meta picture um, of these three levels. The themes aren't always mutually exclusive, so I kind of organize the data, but they can also be, uh, there are means you will see that might belong in more than one. And uh, first we have the global level that reflects how uh, they navigate and intervene in global political dynamics. And seeing that the timing of this analysis, so when I was writing this, it was like December, January, February, and then like, I did revisions later, but the article was already written and the data was already collected. Um, so, and um, because that coincided with the global COVID-19 pandemic, and there were certain like big global events such as the US brokered agreement between Israel, the UAE and Bahrain, uh, it's not surprising that there were a lot of memes that commented on sort of these things that were happening around them. Uh, the second level is a state level where I examine memes framing of issues that involve local um, institutional politics. So with the Israeli state, the Knesset, again, there was also like um, ongoing elections. There was a series of like three or four elections in a row that were happening at the time that I was collecting the data. And the third level was that of in-group Palestinian diversity so this level looked at the ways that Palestinian diversity was reflected through the memes, both in terms of how memes as a group portrayed a diverse group of people, but beyond representation, it was also about what intentional steps people took to emphasize that cultural diversity and invite people from different places, people with different dialects to join in on the meme conversation. And this is the part where we're gonna dig in and the part where we're gonna see a lot of memes. So if you're here for that, this section is for you. Um, okay, so we start with navigating global dynamics and many memes re reference US politics and popular culture. And sometimes these things also intersect, right? So reflecting, uh, uh, this reflects the dominance basically of the US on the global cultural stage. It's not surprising since US institutional politics directly impact the politics in Palestine, Israel, and the larger region. And the way that this came up is that many memes use images of US politicians in funny like mashup content or for the purpose of just participating in a certain meme trend. So the Bernie meme went viral after the original image was taken during the inauguration of Joe Biden as president. And here we see Bernie um, uh, wearing his mittens. We can barely see the mittens because they've been replaced uh, by the Palestinian kufi. And this meme was accompanied by a caption. Uh, in Arabic, it was Sa'at Klab, which means like it's super cold. Literally means it's cold as dogs, but that's, it just means it's really cold. Um, other memes also expressed lack of confidence in US politicians, both in their uh, impact in our own country, so here, and in the possibility of them having um, halting the empowerment of oppression locally. So former US President Donald Trump was a common figure in these memes, um, which is also not surprising. Like I think we've seen less Trump memes and less um, Trump tweets since the election, they kind of toned down, but at the time uh, that I was doing this work, they were still circulating and Trump was still tweeting, I believe. Um, so this meme, for example, on the left, uh, it says, um, it's like a fake tweet, it fabricates a tweet. So this isn't a real tweet that Donald Trump shared. And it says, you can take all the status and all the profits, just let me have the homeland. And the caption then said, I am a citizen. 
But this, you know, is sarcastic because it is uh, the exact opposite of what he practiced during his time in office. And the meme on the right uh, uses uh, Trump's tweet, stop the count, to kind of make fun of um, what happens on a night out when you see the waiter calculating your bill. Uh, and I think this was specifically about downtown Haifa. And the normalization of Israel's relationship with Bahrain and the UAE was another global political issue that came up in the memes. Memes created parodical scenes, mocking their relationship and emphasizing their lack of access to enjoy the perks uh, that it might provide certain people. The text in, these, in a lot of these memes uh, and captions repeated that they, meaning the meme makers or meme circulators, can't afford a trip to Dubai themselves. And they also made fun of Haifa's so-called rocket building, um, which looks a lot like uh, du uh, Dubai's Burj Al Arab, which is a really famous hotel in Dubai. Uh, I have a picture coming up next. Um, so here we have, I'm gonna move this for folks who are in the room. Um, so we've got people making fun of, they're making fun of themselves too, right? There's like a comment on class status here and on money. Uh, if you can't afford to travel to Dubai, you can take Haifa's light rail and go to downtown where you can see the Ministry of Interior that has this building that really resembles Dubai's, um, uh, uh, Dubai's Burj Al Arab. And this image um, is of, uh, of an Emirati person. Um, when they come to Haifa and they see this building, they're really mad. And this is kind of, again, mocking kind of a class difference and the, um, who has money, who doesn't have money. Um, so it says when you start a night in downtown Haifa and finish it in Dubai. And for those who aren't familiar, so this is Haifa and this is Dubai. So the buildings do look a lot alike. Uh, and this has been like an ongoing kind of mockery thing since the building was built uh, in the early 2000s, I believe. An important thing to know, um, to notice about uh, the dominance of US culture and meme culture is that what it does, it makes it so that participating in meme culture necessitates a level of fluency in US popular culture. And this necessity for fluency in US culture is exemplified in the use of trending memes. So we saw like the Bernie meme, Donald Trump stuff, um, but also uh, there are a lot of memes that use movies and uh, television shows. So people need to kind of be acquainted with whatever is trending in the US meme culture, but also in US popular culture and politics in general. So there are a lot of memes that use like The Office. Uh, I don't know, I can think of like the Spider-Man meme where he's pointing. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, Game of Thrones memes, et cetera. On the other hand though, despite US culture kind of having that dominant status, it's also notable that many memes mix languages and cultures. And although US cultural fluency is a prerequisite for participating in meme culture, mixing English into Arabic wasn't really encouraged. In fact, the memes kind of drew a hierarchy of languages that intersected with class and gendered connotations. Um, so colloquial Palestinian Arabic dialect uh, was put kind of as the preferred choice as the meme speaker's class choice. And um, Fusha, also known as modern standard Arabic was portrayed as the hipster choice or the overly intellectual kind of snobby choice. Um, if anyone in this room speaks or is learning Arabic, just FYI, this is what the meme makers say, it's not me. Um, mixing English was portrayed in the memes as being either classist or trying to associate with a higher class. So whether you're making it or not, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, it was also portrayed as less masculine and so was mixing Hebrew. Mixing Hebrew was mocked as an attempt to overcompensate or sometimes was associated with fragile masculinity or kind of trying too hard. Ultimately, Palestinian makers use of global political and cultural content in memes reflects kind of their positionality, the place where they stand. 
while it's also a way for them to intervene in that reality and rethink that hierarchy and place themselves within it. Um, they reassign meanings to the cultures and politics that they are consuming, but also creating. It's a way to understand or make sense of the space around them and the cultures around them, but also to move between these cultures and these spaces. So the lack of confidence in politicians that I mentioned at the global level extended itself also to Israeli state politics, including Palestinian members of the Knesset as well. Um, when it came to Israeli political figures like former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who was still Prime Minister at the time that I was doing this work, memes pointed to a type of hypocrisy, whereby politicians in general reach out to Palestinians for votes, but without taking any actions to improve the situation of Palestinians living in Israeli cities or towns or neighborhoods on the ground. The memes express a deficiency in resources and infrastructure that impact the Palestinian community. This meme addresses it in Haifa specifically, citing the different treatment and resources that Palestinians in neighborhoods like Abbas and Wadi Nisnas get from the municipality. These are predominantly Palestinian neighborhoods. Um, Al-Wad, uh, which is at the very bottom here, I'm gonna move this window, um, is a historically Palestinian neighborhood. Um, and on the other side of that, we have neighborhoods like Al-Karmel, a predominantly Jewish Israeli neighborhood that are getting sort of the better treatment of the Haifa municipality. And again, I wanna remind everyone that when I was writing this, um, just to give some context, the state of Israel was headed towards its fourth election in two years. Then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had won the past three elections, but only by a margin, uh, and nearly failed to create a government coalition between different parties. And much of this process is kind of reflected in the means. Uh, there are means like about voting, about elections, about campaigning, a series of memes pointed um, directly towards Netanyahu's efforts. Uh, they talk about Netanyahu, um, how he intends to milk Arabs uh, and play games with people in attempt to lure some Palestinians into voting for him or to trick them into voting for him. So we have this meme on the left here. We see an image of Netanyahu. I think you can see it more clearly like on the Instagram account itself. For some reason, the screenshot didn't capture that word very well, but he's playing soccer on the beach and it says, I'm going to play ball with you or like, I'm going to use you to play ball. Um, and on the right here, we have a game of chess where I think the key piece here is Salam Alaikum, like a mispronunciation of Salam Alaikum. I think there was a speech that Netanyahu gave where he tried to say hello in Arabic, but it was mis pronounced. Uh, and so meme makers are kind of mocking that effort that like, oh, with a single misspelled word, you think that you're going to trick people into voting for you. And that's not it. Memes also expressed a lack of confidence in Palestinian members of the Israeli Knesset. Many of them, uh, of those uh, members, were portrayed in a mocking or parodic way. This was especially the case for the joint list, Al-Qa'im al-Mushtaraka, an alliance that was formed in 2015 between uh, parties that have a Palestinian majority in the Knesset. It's sort of a strategy that maybe if we create a joint list that has all of these four Palestinian majority parties, maybe they will get kind of a better seating in the, in the Knesset. Um, so memes were used to criticize certain Knesset members, to point to their inauthenticity and hypocrisy, the example here shows Mansour Abbas, a common figure in the memes. Mansour Abbas was memed a lot. He, there were like a few folks who were memed a lot. Uh, this guy, uh, Mansour Abbas, separated from the Muslim party, uh, his Muslim party, from the joint list that was created in 2015. And he's portrayed a lot in memes as someone who's willing to go to extreme lengths just to gain political power even if that means betraying his own people's interests. And here Abbas is criticized for closing up to Netanyahu's family and doing whatever Netanyahu asks him to. So here we have Netanyahu, his wife, Sarah, and their son, Yair, on the magic carpet. And 
some more context of like, since I wrote this thing, uh, Mansour Abbas split from the joint list completely and he created a, a United Arab list that actually is only his party. Um, and this, uh, this party was instrumental to forming the Israeli Knesset coalition in June of 2021. So he kind of stayed on brand and actually like ended up helping form the current Israeli government coalition. Memes also raised issues concerning cultural erasure. So we already saw kind of this meme, there was a spoiler alert earlier. Uh, they commented on the practice in which Zionists appropriate foods like hummus and falafel. And um, the one here kind of reflects this long-standing tension that rises from claims of hummus and falafel as Israeli food, using an image from the January 6th uh, insurrection uh, in the US Capitol. And this brings me to the third section, uh, navigating the Palestinian experience and cultural diversity. So means also express the diversity of Palestinian culture and subcultures within that culture, uh, as well as common experiences of Palestinian youth. And by youth, I mean the people who are creating and circulating the memes. If I had to guess their ages, I would say it's uh, maybe 16 to 30 something, like early 30s. Um, a recurrent theme, for example, consisted of memes that were mainly concerned with the student experience, a college student experience. Many Palestinian students uh, leave their hometowns or in, for universities in cities like Haifa, Tel Aviv, or Jerusalem, um, or even to um, uh, study abroad. Uh, Jordan is like a very common place for people to go study, um, or Janine in the West Bank, and they return to their own hometowns on the weekends. And they refer to it as El Balad, which just means the town, but that's how we refer to our hometowns. And honestly, a whole paper could be written about these like uh, university versus Balad memes or the student experience memes. People commented on the difference between their town and their university town. They share experience like looking for apartments in a crowded and expensive city, uh, living on a low budget, shopping online on a low budget, asking parents for money every week or doing laundry at home, which I also did in college. Um, and memes show how youth make sense of these different cultures that they are navigating and the cultures that exist in each one of the universities. So here we have an example on the right, pointing out how people dress in Haifa University versus a kind of less formal uh, dress that's uh, common to the Technion. Um, I went to the Hebrew University, I'd say it was more on the Technion side of things. Um, and here we have Bernie Sanders. I think a lot of us saw this meme, it's from the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, and here you have kind of a university student going home and to ask their parents for money yet again. And memes also included captions that were calling on people from different places around Palestine, acknowledging not only the diversity of the followers of the specific meme account and the fan base of the meme account, but also uh, the mobility of people within Palestine and how they move around Palestine. Um, they write kind of shout outs to people from different cities or towns using their local dialect, inviting them to participate. So for example, I'll give an example of the town of Kufr Kanna. So like people would say like, hey, like where's the people, where are the people of Kufr Kanna? Like, tell us how you say this phrase or something like that. And the caveat I'll mention here is that not all means are like disrupting oppression and creating an inclusive environment. There's really, it's really a mixed bag. I definitely saw some memes. Uh, I would say that they're a minority, but they did exist that were sexist and homophobic. These types of memes kind of mocked women commenting on like makeup habits, how people pose for photos and other kind of stereotyping um, um, portrayals. Um, some memes associated being gay with a lack of masculinity in a way that can reinforce toxic masculine and homophobic attitudes. And there were also kind of cultural rivalries that came across in the memes. So here we have the Haifa University versus Technion rivalry. There's Nazareth versus Haifa. Um, 
high sus Kermel neighborhood that we saw earlier versus downtown, kind of pointing to different um, uh, comparisons. And these comparisons highlight what kind of I already alluded to a little bit before, that these memes are both reflective and also function for navigating these spaces. So who gets to go where or how should you behave when you go somewhere? So in this meme, we see someone from Nazareth and um, if they go, how they behave in order to fit in if they go to Haifa. So this meme basically portrays the process of code switching by using uh, these dog memes. So on the left side, we have a person from Nazareth when they're in Nazareth. So they're the swole dog, the larger, more muscular dog. Um, and they're using like heavy Nazarene slang, uh, saying things like, I'm telling you, I'll beat him up. And then when the, when the person from Nazareth goes to Haifa, they become smaller. Suddenly they're mixing English using words like vibe and downtown. And again, portrayed perhaps as less toxic masculine um, and more uh, trying to confirm with the, conform with the environment that's surrounding them. Memes as mapping tools then chart out the social stratification and indicate where the boundaries are drawn between different social groups and subgroups within the group of Palestinian youth. They tell us how people from these different subgroups might experience space when they move in it and who gets to go where in mixed cities. In addition, they show us who holds power to decide regarding mobility and regarding resources and infrastructure. Mixing popular culture and current events, memes connect livid experience of culture to the discourse that's around it and create an intervention in it. I suggest memes as mapping tools that introduce their consumers to the lay of the land, culturally, politically, and spatially speaking, and allow their producers to comment on and intervene in those spatial and political dynamics. Memes draw out not only the different spaces of neighborhoods, cities, and the world, but also map out the social stratification related to these spatial politics, answering questions like, who can and can't navigate these spaces easily or smoothly? Who holds power in these spaces? Who decides where resources go? Or to present some more concrete examples, uh, some more concrete examples based on the memes that we saw, who owns downtown Haifa on a Thursday night? Who is and isn't welcome in downtown? Which neighborhoods in Haifa are thriving? Which ones are drowning? How does a person from Nazareth need to act in Nazareth and how do they need to act in Haifa? Where do Palestinians stand on the chessboard or the soccer field of Israeli politics? Memes made by Palestinian youth in Israel map out the cultural and political terrain showing where they stand on this map, their positionality in a complex web of cultural politics and political dynamics, and how they move within that cultural, political, and spatial landscape. Their precarious citizen status, which I talk about a little bit more in the article if you're interested, is also reflected in the complex experience that's mapped out through the means that they make, which demand deep knowledge of the space, the languages, the dialects, the culture and subculture, ways to behave and navigate the space smoothly, where to go for better resources or to find spaces with people who have similar values. The urban spaces of Haifa and Nazareth, just like the rest of the region, region are continually changing and being contested. Both Haifa and Nazareth are rich in Palestinian history and cultural life. Although these cities are technically mixed, uh, housing both Israeli Jewish population and the Palestinian population, the neighborhoods remain largely segregated. In the recent few years, Polly Withers writes about this. I can't remember if I put a quote. Oh, no, sorry. Um, in the recent few years in Haifa, notably, there has been um, a process where middle, middle class youth are kind of refashioning urban spaces into enclaves that center Palestinians and their culture and where Israeli Jewish citizens are considered guests. And so memes are part of this larger process. The meme content from these mixed cities is in line with narratives that break what's been labeled the myth of coexistence 
Diana Butto wrote in the New York Times recently about this myth that Palestinians and Israeli Jews in mixed cities are a model for coexistence. The memes that I looked at here draw a picture where Palestinians and Israeli Jews do not spend time together in the same spaces and do not receive the same rights or infrastructural resources. The memes in this corpus mix popular culture from different parts of the world, and some of them notably, mixing cultures and languages becomes a way to celebrate or point inwards towards either problems or issues within Palestinian culture itself. Popular culture that's coming predominantly from the US then is oftentimes used or deployed as a means for navigating the local cultural landscape. And it's usually at this point that I ask what's at stake. So the conceptualization of memes as mapping tools acknowledges that memes are implicated in the relationship between the spatial, political, and technological. I think it's this side. Bear with me, almost done. Um, memes as mapping tools helps us draw the connection between digital culture to space and life in cities. The conceptualization of memes as cultural mapping tools also complicates the idea that new media technology is going to necessarily be a liberatory force or a democratizing force. This framework can show us how memes, uh, meme culture is simultaneously creating new possibilities for inclusion and celebration, while it can also reinforce existing systems of repression, as we saw with the examples that reinforce sexism or homophobia. But new media has been and still is also leveraged to combat the segmentation that's enforced by settler colonialism. Using means as mapping tools can allow us to assess where that cultural segmentation stands at a certain moment in time and from a specific cultural perspective. What these memes accomplish here is carving out room for Palestinian youth within these cultural spaces that are difficult to navigate or where they experience risks or limitations. Memes become part of that process that Polly Withers talks about um, of refashioning urban spaces into enclaves that center Palestinians and their culture. So they use digital culture vernacular as part of a larger cultural shift to make room for and maintain the connections across Palestinian culture. For example, by inviting participants with different accents and from different towns, meme makers push for a recognition of Palestinian lived experience and hold space for their cultural diversity. The memes map out Palestinian youth aspirations for their culture, politics, their desired values. They draw hard boundaries when it comes to politicians, Israeli or Palestinian or global, that are promoting settler colonialism and working against their interests. They point to a clear direction of which they think justice would look like. Having fun with cultural diversity, equitable distribution of rights, resources, and a stop to colonial erasure and cultural appropriation. So some final thoughts to close. Um, on a personal note, kind of, this is my first time writing about Haifa. This is a city where I grew up um, and I was writing about it, as I mentioned, during COVID-19 pandemic, where there didn't seem to be a prospect of visiting. There were a lot of memories uh, that came up during that time, a lot of important political uh, things that were going on. Um, and those things can make the writing process very interesting. So I just kind of wanted to throw it out there because I recognize that I'm not the first and definitely not the only one who has a personal experience like that uh, and just wanted to make that process um, less invisible. And as I mentioned, this article uh, has just been published in Information, Communication and Society. So please check it out. If for any reason you don't have access, shoot me an email. Uh, it's part of a special issue that they just published about memes and politics. So if this is a topic that interests you in general, there are plenty of cool papers to check out. Um, and kind of where this, to talk about where this work might go in the future. One is um, I will continue to explore um, memes that are made by Palestinians. I think this is a very important area to study. There's a lot of complexity there. It's not an area that's been explored. And a lot has happened again since I wrote this December, January. It's kind of crazy to think how within you know the 
uh, big turmoil that went on, I think started in April, May, was that when it was happening? And then June, there was elections and things kind of continue to happen and change all the time. Uh, and so the memes also change. There are new trends and new things to write about. So I do think about publishing a follow-up article and your questions and ideas today uh, might help um, carve out the direction uh, that that might take. And for people who are thinking about memes as mapping tools, I might also recommend kind of a more narrow focus, both for myself and for you. Uh, since this paper was kind of the first one on Palestinian memes, I went and explored the accounts as is uh, and covered so many different themes and so many different small ideas here and there. And I think now that I'm reviewing it, I'm like, oh, each one of these can actually benefit from uh, being focused on and being kind of the sole topic uh, could be a paper on its own. So the message that I would wanna leave you with today is that memes and digital culture in general are part of our space. They're in, a, in relationship with our space, going back to that um, technological, spatial, political relationship. So how do we make sense of this relationship? I'd be interested to see, for example, what image of the world uh, do memes draw? Um, how could they now? How could they dictate what where we go in the world, uh, or other ways that technology is used to reinforce and disrupt and disrupt oppressive power dynamics on the ground? And again, I want to end by thanking everybody for listening. Thank you, Andrew. I think we made it through. <laughs> and um, we'll open it up for Q and A now. But I'm gonna um, put my email up here. If uh, I know we have some folks online as well, if you feel like reaching out, um, please be in touch. Thank you all. And welcome, Justin. Yeah, well, I, I, we can just do this together. Okay. <laughs> People still want to see you. I can just sort of help. I think they can see me on multiple screens. That's so good. Um, multiple windows. Questions. Can people raise their hands, or should they just type in the chat? What's the? You know, sorry, the remote. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so remote, I think I'll be questions. If you, are you going to? Yeah. Yeah. Start, so start in the room, and then we. Can... Great. So we'll take a few questions from the room while the people online should feel free to type their questions in the chat, and Andrew will flag us when we have some good ones. Um, but uh, I mean, that was terrific, Swap. Well. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you sure. so much. I really enjoyed it. I have some things. Let's see what questions do we have in the room to start with. Who do I need to kick it off? Hi, I'm Ian Conrad. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Uh, really interesting. Um, I wonder how we can understand the effect of these things. You know, or or how? I mean, I, I know it's really hard to know the kinds of effects there are, but I, I wonder what we might point to, are there some ways to say, I mean, I, I agree they're political, they certainly map cultural boundaries, uh, we see gender, we see uh, national state politics, global politics. Um, I, I wonder, wonder though, that given the kind of snarky <laughs> attitudes, you know, that. Does that kind of undermine a little bit, or, or you know, I know snarky could be pretty political too. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make it not political, but, but there always seems to be a bit of a distancing that goes on with the, the snark aspect of it, um, and and then oh, I, it's just you know, oh, it's just a joke, or I'm just being funny, or you know, and and so it, it, so that that's sort of the the, the general question of, of and I you know I agree that there are political, but but I can also imagine the, the criticism that they're not that, uh, or they can't really have that, like it's clickivism, it's like whatever it is, so, you know, it's not, it's not real political action, you know, it's the old school. Um, so that, that's a, the question, and, and part of it too is, is, do you talk to the people who interpret these memes? You know, we, we didn't get a lot of voices of people who say, oh yeah, when I saw this meme, it really, it did this for me or it did that for me, and, and that might be a way of, of giving and you know, maybe a little more meat on the bone for what kinds of reaction people have besides you. So that, that was sort of, and I'm asking that as an anthropologist too, but we, we come up with lots of ideas, but we don't trust any of them until you know, five or six weeks until back to us. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm wondering about that. 
Thank you. Uh, well, first, it's nice to meet you for, I think this is our first time meeting. Um, and uh, okay, the first part of your question was sort of about the effect of memes. And I think it's, you know, this is the, the, the business of uh, like pr proving causality, right? And it's hard, like, unless someone tells me like, I did this because I saw a meme and this was the main reason, like before that, I had no idea I was gonna do it and then I did it. And this hasn't happened to me in an interview yet. So I cannot prove causality, but kind of the wider question of thinking about, are they political or are they not? I think this is also up for negotiation. Like I define politics very broadly. And for me, like participating in culture and being part of a cultural shift, you know, you're pushing, you might be not, you know, you might not be pushing in like a super strong way, but sort of pushing a little bit. And to me, that is political, especially that, a lot of people might be navigating a very sensitive kind of area where either their own safety or their work or something uh, might be at risk. So that very small push is also kind of political. Um, but I know that for some people, political is you've got to be outside with a sign. Um, and so, and some of those people are doing both. Like I, maybe not in this case specifically, I don't know. Like. Uh, those memes, there was meme accounts specifically are anonymous. Like I've uh, not been able, despite being from Haifa and it's like a small community, I haven't been able to crack who is doing Haifa memes. If you, if you guys find out, let me know. Um, but uh, I've done interviews for my dissertation and uh, I agree it's interesting, but things come up. Um, a lot of times it like maybe confirms what I'm thinking or gives me new ideas. Sometimes there are ideas that like keep coming up that I'm like trying to push away and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to deal with this. Like a lot of people talk about memes as their own language or a universal language. I remember working on my dissertation kind of trying to steer clear from that like lingua franca metaphor, uh, but people kept mentioning it. So I like, okay, if this is what people are saying then this is important. Um, but I am, since those memes, uh, meme accounts specifically were anonymous, I kind of didn't want to you know, broach people's anonymity without their consent in any way. Thank you. That one was the first one. Thank you for the song. Thank you. I'm really glad you mentioned that you grew up in Haifa and this is that really added. I was going to ask about the personality. Because in a way, like, the two things are not made, but especially for this one that are very specific to the top of the heat, right, to be able to navigate that map. Um, just means that our sound identification. Um, and I found myself sort of feeling both comfortable but also uncomfortable to how to act with someone outside of me. So my question for you as a scholar is me. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think, well, one is like my positionality in this case, I think it really helps me understand and interpret, especially writing this while like not being able to be there physically at writing about space, I think it's interesting. Um, and in terms of um, bringing memes to a different context, so in my work, like context is really important. So I do a lot of contextualization when I'm writing. That was kind of one of my beefs with reviewer two in the process of writing this article is like, I'm giving as much contextualization as I can, especially in a region where things are changing constantly. So I'm not trained as a historian at all. I don't really have that skill, but I was trying as best I can to capture, like that's why I keep saying like, it captures what was going on in the moment. Um, and even though this is a meme that you can still go to the account and you can still see kind of the timing of when it was posted and when it was shared is also important. Um, and even now, kind of the context that I was giving throughout, that's not the article that since it was written also matters of like, okay, what ended up happening? Like, what do we know now that we didn't know then? So I, I understand that for someone who's not familiar with the context, it can kind of be a little bit disconnected. Um, but I think it's, you know, 
they're worth exploring because they also teach us about either other places, other contexts, other ways that memes are used. At the end of the day, I'm not a historian of Haifa, like at all. Um, and my goal is to really look at digital media um, and to really understand it. I think it takes stepping out of kind of the dominantly familiar things. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. What, one of the things that you, you showed us in the memes was, I mean, some of these memes are, I mean, they're global, so they're universal, but you know, the sort of like, uh, I'm looking over my the Bernie meme, or yeah, like the, well, the, well, yeah, boy, the distracted boyfriend meme. The distracted boyfriend seems like particularly universal. Like, like all human beings get distracted by things. Um, or even the, the sort of baby drowning who turns in the old person under the sea. Yeah. Um, but it seems like part of what happens in the memes is you take these things which should be universally recognizable, and then you add some kind of in-joke to them that 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 renders it somehow only parsable to like a very small group of people. Yeah. Um, what, like, what's the appeal? What's the appeal of taking something universal and making it, um, like why not, why not just make your own in-jokes? What's the, what's the draw do you think of like, that kind of, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny thing to take a universal thing and make it only funny to, you know, whatever, 12 people in high five or that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I think, you know, like those memes actually, like uh, those accounts, have a um, bigger following than some of the things that I explored for my dissertation. So I think actually like looking at memes that are maybe not necessarily trying to go viral. Like I interviewed people who are like, I'm not really trying to have more following. I made this account because I was sending my friends memes on the chat group and they told me, well, why don't you make this account? And then slowly more people start following them. But again, there's a limitation, right? Especially with the culture mixing because if you're looking at a Bernie meme that is mixing Arabic, for example, and a lot of times it's spoken Arabic, so it's specifically the Palestinian dialect, um, that might be like understandable to people in like the Levant, like broadly defined, uh, but that's still like kind of a limited group of people. And if you take in having to know the politics, having to know the space, the ones that are about like downtown and things like that, like it keeps narrowing down the audience. Um, but I think that is what sometimes tends to make it more funny for those who get it. There's a certain amount of like pride, I think, that we get when we get the joke and we know that others might not get the joke. Um, we feel smart, I think. You know, I'm again, I'm not a psychologist. This is just like out of instinct of thinking where it is. But in terms of um, political power, I think that there is a power move in deciding who's included and excluded. Because when people are editing an image, they're making decisions. Like this is not, you know, maybe they're not thinking about them taking days writing papers, uh, but they are making decisions of like, oh, should I put English in here? Should I not? Like, should I put this in a Nazareth accent or in a, a more like broadly understood accent? So there are, these are kind of decisions to include and exclude. So to me, like that is a power move. Um, and I think, you know, looking at that, looking at Haifa memes along with kind of the cultural, like urban, like nightlife and music scene that's been developing, that is kind of trying to create this like separate um, safe space almost for Palestinian life. Uh, looking at these together, I think is really interesting. Right. Uh, I mean, just a quick comment back to your question earlier. I thought it was interesting that you posed know, the question whether it means or people, because, I mean, for me, stand up comedy, the like, television, and all these comedy shows are explicitly doing shape political discourse and also can speak to decision making or shifts in attitudes, right? And so, kind of, my generation, my generation, well, I Needs are the so they're actually more important than what is happening on the public So, just you know, for me, it's not even a question. Causality is hard for the important, but the question I have for you is because I'm from the architecture department, I'm interesting things to both look at the symbolism of like the kinds of spaces that are being represented. But also the kinds of ways in which people are transversing. So, 
So I'm just curious about what's next with that. Are you going to continue to develop that um, kind of training and analysis? Because I know in the world of work, I'm sure you um, this is something that is kind of like open for interpretation, but no one's really doing anything exciting by that. So <laughs> I'm hoping you might. <laughs> and I the hope. Um, uh, I I do plan uh, to publish maybe within the next year or two kind of a follow up article, uh, continuing to think about memes um, as like creative digital media and their relationship to space. Uh, I feel like there's there's more there there, uh, and I think Palestine is like a great example for thinking about this because space is so contested and things are moving um, fast all the time, and. Uh, even though like I will be, I do plan to draw like in the future more from architecture or urban planning or like the critical side uh, from there because my work is interdisciplinary. So if you have recommendations, do let me know. Uh, so yeah, I think there will be more coming and if this topic is exciting for you, I, I'd love to hear more from your perspective as, an, as, as like someone who knows architecture. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah. I'm the last, uh, one of the graduates of KMS. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me talk. I enjoyed hearing you. So, I'm very interested. Great. Um, so, uh, kind of just more questions about what you recite about the usage of language. The first one is how do you arrive at the conclusion of how users prioritize language? Mm -hmm. uh, we had a very interview. I'm just taking my question. I want to watch your stuff. And the second one is. How do you see that the use of English, of English in the means relates to your comment about the diabolic gloss of it, right? Uh, like if English becomes like, like the use of English is political as like a feministic, or if it becomes sort of like a cosmopolitan language that is a common right? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. So the, to answer like the method thing is like a lot of times, um, with um because memes use like a caption that's in english so if it remains in english and remains as is uh to me that's like it's part of the meme um and so that's maybe where it falls into like cosmopolitanism and things like that where it's not like oh i'm gonna use english for this one but if you think like maybe as an opposite example um of uh the meme that had like the guy from nazareth when they go when they go to haifa and suddenly they're using English words deliberately. So then there were words like vibe, like downtown, like those are words that don't necessarily have to be in English. Uh, knowing, again, knowing the context, I know that we don't usually say those in English, um, in Haifa specifically. And so there's an element there that, you know, a lot of it is like the method is like feeling out, like, is this a common thing? Um, does it seem like, is it an intentional thing? Is it part of kind of the overall message? Uh, and a lot of what I like end up saying comes from recurring themes. So I gave like very few examples here, but the sample size was 150 memes, uh, which you know would be my pleasure to just like go through all of them with you, but um, we'll probably not make a very good presentation in the end. So if I see something that is constantly happening, then to me, that's like a theme that is coming up. So let's take a question here. Yeah, so we're going to do maybe two. To, that's um, great. To check. So early on in the presentation, um, maybe halfway through, there's a question that came in from uh, Professor Ann Diego in UMass Amherst asking why is there a disconnect between cultural popularity of Arabic linguistic hybridity slash code switching, especially among youth and linguistic differentiation? Um. Is this a disconnect from, um, wait, I'm thinking about this in an example. I think I need a clarification if like the disconnect is coming through in um, this work specifically or like a disconnect um, culturally speaking or like speaking on the, towards the context itself. Okay, if the, um, is it the uh, sentence? To the chat or So let's go to uh, Carlton Zalewski. Ask, uh, welcome to the neighborhood, Salah. Oh, hi, Carlton. <laughs> you hear a bit more about the meme site. Um, do memes show up there because the user happened to post them, or do they end up there because or after 
they've already circulated that demonstrates some popularity of uh, virality. In other words, are we seeing the most popular memes or the most recent? Oh, good question. Um, so the memes that I focused on here uh, specifically are the most recent 50 that are relevant. So there are a few here and there that were deemed not relevant, as I explained before, um, based on their either content or if they're not a meme, but I use the most recent 50. And those are definitely, uh, especially with the Nazareth memes account and the Haifa memes account, um, I know that those are memes that were created kind of by um, these Instagram users. Um, the other account, uh, Mess on the Inside, uh, might have been using and reusing uh, certain trending memes, but um, they're mostly, I would say, as original <laughs> as a meme gets uh, in terms of that they were created by these Instagram users. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Um, when you said that it was wonderful, um, let's talk about the platforms that people have been as well as Instagram. What is it like cross pollination with the children? It's very odd. Could they be taking stuff from Twitter or other interests that are in the world? Now, for Snapchat, too, you can do that. And whether the platform itself is allowed to be done, other conversations like that. Yeah, um, so I would say that there were, there, um, were more conversations happening about that on uh, some of these meme accounts since kind of the events that began, began unfolding since March, April, May, like, um, with all the protests. And, you know, the more that the content becomes political, the more likely it is to be censored by Instagram in some ways. And then when it is censored, we usually see, like, um, people who own the account uh, trying to speak up about it. Uh, um, this is not true for the accounts that I, I'm using here at this time, but there are meme accounts that say in their profile description, here's my alt account. And so they have already created an alt account by using maybe the same username and adding like a number or something like that. So they have like an alternative account in case this one shuts down that are like all of their fans are already following them on the other one. Um, and regarding kind of the cross-pollination between <laughs> different platforms. So um, one of those pages also has a Facebook page and that posts the same things. Um, uh, there isn't like for Palestinians, I would say are not, Palestinians that are situated in Palestine, I would say are not using Twitter as much as Facebook and Instagram, especially as a source for memes. Um, so I did kind of choose Instagram, despite having like a couple of these pages on Facebook, because it was where like things felt like they were happening, you know, that's where things are posted and shared. And um, um, I also looked at like where they had more followers, not as a measurement, but like as part of the larger picture, like where is there more activity happening? Um, yeah, I think I got all of your questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Paul Roque, uh, faculty in CMS. Um, Hi. Thank you. It's really great. I really appreciate the benefits of our method, especially when you think of all these websites. I want to apply this to and see what kind of that emerges. And thinking about the mapping of the memes themselves, I was curious. You really brought out how much memes are operating as a kind of remapping of, of relationality between different parties. Yeah. And I was curious. It seemed like there's a, a few kind of recurring formal structures, whether it's A versus B or any subordinate B or uh, triangles like the structure of the kind of structure. And maybe it gets more complicated from there. Like, that's what seems especially complicated. Yeah. I was curious if there's a different politics with these different structures. And if there are more complicated politics and more complicated. Oh, I do. Something like a chip or is it maybe operating differently? Yeah, now I'm thinking also of the meme of like um, the Haifa infra infrastructure meme where you see like the skeleton that's drowning at the bottom and then the baby swimming at the top, kind of the mother helping one of the babies but not the other. Um, so there is something to the structure. I think you're talking about like a visual structure as well as, you know, um, that helps kind of deliver the message. I didn't compare the structures, uh, I'll be honest, but I, I appreciate you asking this question because I think it's a great idea to look at. Uh, kind of how, what the structures are doing 
uh, to kind of deliver this message um, of relationality that I talked about, because I think there's a there there. Like there were a lot of, you know, A versus B, like we saw with the um, dog meme with the Nazareth guy, or like the, um, the way people dress in Haifa University versus the Technion. Like there were some of these memes that were comparing. I think that was definitely like a repeated format. Um, but when it comes to the chess one and like the ones that are more complex, uh, I do think that I would need to look back at the memes and see if there is kind of a repeated pattern there. Paul's question made me think of another one, which I would definitely answer or think about, which is also sort of methodological. Like Paul sort of proposes, like, oh, you just did something really cool here that I could take to all these other different sites. Um, but your also, work is also really local um, and particular, particular place. Like, of the sort of methods that you're using to examine these things, what do you feel like you would feel comfortable telling a bunch of graduate students, like, oh, yeah, go and try this because it'll, it'll probably be useful in other places? And what feels like more particular to the examination? you know, of one city that you know really well um, at this particular point in time? I mean, go and try it in other places. <laughs> um, um, but uh, always consider the, uh, the ethics of the work that you're doing, uh, what you're bringing and taking from this space, um, your positionality, as Anna mentioned, um, in relation to the space. Um, I am, I would be really curious to see people using kind of memes as, you know, for to like how they map out the culture. Um, of Boston, of MIT, like there are so many things that can be done. And so I think the local examples are used, um, you know, like they're, they're useful for understanding Haifa, but this really my goal is like to understand digital media better and to understand how digital media can uh, facilitate a certain relationship to the space or not. Um, but yeah, and I will say that uh, knowing the context really well and providing context, so if you're writing, providing context for your readers, uh, considering that as part of your method and part of your ethics, I think is really important. So, yeah. Anything else online? Yeah, so we have a question from Professor Jim Parody here at the University of Writing. He writes, I still remember the Trump Dolphin meeting on the border and actually through. It was snarky for sure, but the visual juxtaposition is hard to erase. I wonder about the power of these image juxtapositions and the almost instantaneous, hard to capture essence of the moment. Can you say a bit more about how memes are unpacked? I assume he means like how memes are unpacked as part of my method. Um, I mean, my answer to that would be like what we were just talking about, which is context. So um, understanding like when that meme was born, like where this image was taken. Uh, I think this is especially important with memes that are pointing to a certain type of uh, politics or political relationship, because, you know, like if, we're, if we go back to the distracted boyfriend meme where it's like me, like, you know, getting distracted from work, like that is a universal and repeated uh, kind of behavior that many people can recognize. But if we are thinking about Trump at the border, or that immediately made me think of the meme with Netanyahu playing soccer on the beach. Um, so unpacking kind of the context of this was during election time. Uh, here is the strategy that Netanyahu was known for. Uh, here is what uh, people who, um, you know, um, we're writing maybe either like in the news or on social media, like what the discourse was kind of around that event overall. So context plays a huge role here. So we see that M posted a response. Oh yeah, that mixing English and Arabic is not really encouraged. Hmm? Uh, well, what I meant by that is, uh, like in the example where um, we see uh, the guy from Nazareth going to Haifa, so mixing English in that way, and this is also, I think it answers Anne's question, of, like it's not necessarily the Arabizi example, which is like mixing English and Arabic together as the same words or as the same grammar, but rather using English words as a way to relate to maybe a higher class or try to perform. So anything like it's a, the authenticity is really important here. So any hint of kind of a forced type of use uh, that might indicate some sort of like inauthenticity or trying to associate with something that you're not really reading as you are um, is kind of discouraged to say the least. It's like mocked often. But I mean, you are part of 
that class or that field that like no regulation um, actually feels that it is well seen that we need to be seen or not. If you if you are part of well, this is where we need to go to the audience uh, analysis um, and do some interviews. I think the way that the meme portrays it is mocking it. So I'm going to pretend that I was in a class that liked to mix unnecessary English words into my language that is not pr practiced um, among maybe like working class or lower class people. Um, then I would say if I saw a meme that was mocking my behavior, I probably might not agree with it, but that's just based on a guess. Um, this makes me want to like take the same meme and just like ask different people how they respond to it. I think that would be great. Time for one more question. Or that we just say thanks to Salafa for a terrific talk. Oh, oh I think I know you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 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 I, I can imagine like people on both sides of that sort of like interpreting that in different ways. It's like it's sort of, it could be divisive, but it could also be like one to take either perspective. Like, I would like to look like the person on the right. I would like to look like the person on the left. Like, is there is there a sense that there's more that are sort of like aiming to divide than to sort of like allow some multiple entry points into it that could allow people to sort of take different perspectives on a single meaning? I'd say like speaking about these accounts specifically or the yeah. names that I looked at <laughs> very specifically. Um, I, you know, I don't think that there are more memes that are divisive. These could be read in a divisive way, but I think for the most part, it's like, oh, true. Like, they really, you know, there really is that type of cultural difference. Um, and the goal is really to make people laugh and participate rather than kind of be like, you shouldn't dress this way. Um, this was especially true for two of the meme accounts. And the third one, it was the one that sometimes had like homophobic or sexist type of portrayals. Um, they were not very common, but things like, oh, you know, like this is how girls like to take pictures, um, kind of mocking the way that like women might pose um, or do their makeup or whatever. So those I would probably label as like among maybe the more divisive group. Thank you. Good. Well, thanks for a terrific talk, Salaf. So thanks everyone for a great thank conversation. You. And thanks, Andrew, for facilitating. And thanks everybody online for joining us. So we'll give you a last round of applause.